Our, our next speaker really needs no introduction, but I was thrilled when I reached out to uh, Esther Dyson and she agreed to talk. She's really been a bellwether for trend setting in, in the uh, space between healthcare and technology for many, many years. So I'm really delighted to have Esther come and share her insights with us. Thanks very much. Hi, good morning. Okay. Great. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, to some extent, what Charles was talking about is what I'm going to be referring to in, in the third market. And so it's, he was great. I should have gone before him because he's, he's the culmination of all of this. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about this morning is the three markets of health. And then I want to add a coda that won't have any slides. Uh, how many of you here are in fact in the institutional healthcare market? Work for a hospital, you're a doctor, pharma. Okay, how many of you are startups, uh, yeah, disruptive influences, whatever? <laughs> okay. Press, other, other bystanders? Great. So this is, this is more of a health car market than I'm used to speaking to. I, I tend to hang out with the disruptors. Uh, and as you heard yesterday, this market is changing dramatically. My slides are really more illustrations. They aren't, you don't need to pay too much attention to them. This is the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India. It's probably not the kind of place you usually deal with, but it's, it's traditional remedial healthcare. They're making prostheses for people and uh, so forth and so on. The issue in the healthcare market that's changing dramatically is we're moving from short-term thinking, fixing things that are broken, to long-term thinking, trying to keep them from getting broken in the first place. But in the end, that's really not the market that traditional healthcare can deal with because you want to reach people before they become patients while they're still in the market for bad health. This is the market that we don't talk about as much. It's, it's usually positioned in some other way, but it's billions and billions of dollars trying to get people to eat the marshmallows. Advertising, foods designed to be, as Charles said, designed to trigger a compulsion to eat them. Salt, sugar, alcohol, smoking, all those kinds of things. We heard yesterday that hospitals can kill. Uh, we all know how that happens, medical errors and so forth and so on. But I'm going to be slightly, uh, slightly rude here. Uh, health conferences can kill. This is not from here. This is from the Strata RX conference last week. But I'd, I'd like to ask you, how many of you ate the breakfast here? Okay. How many of you know a healthy breakfast is important? <laughs> how many of you feel you had a compulsion to eat that breakfast versus it was put in front of you and that's what you ate? The point here is it's, it's not simply the person and their own choices. It's the choices or the defaults that society puts in front of them, whether it's health conferences or school lunches or how a city is laid out or, as you've heard many times, your friends can make you fat. It's not just you, it's the people around you, it's the situation, it's advertising, it's what society offers. And of course, there's huge amounts of money in that, as everybody knows. So what I'd like to talk about, and this is really the meat of the talk, is the third market, health itself. 
Now, that used to be a market mostly for gym clothes, maybe tennis courts, sports clubs, but it wasn't really a very big market compared to the huge markets for institutional health care and for what I would call bad health. That has changed now, or perhaps that's a little premature. It's beginning to change. It's changing because of two big factors. Uh, you could call it health IT. It's devices and sensors and the kinds of things that let you measure stuff, the quantified self-movement. It's also changing because of networks and tools that let you share that information. So this, this is my Fitbit. Uh, I'm wearing it. I'm also wearing a Nike fuel band. You know, I consider myself, I'm, I'm not really a rat. I'm a self-aware human being. I'm pretty healthy. Last night I got to my hotel room having left dinner early before dessert like a good girl. And I was maybe 70 points short of my goal. So I walked around my room flossing. I'm sorry, while I was flossing, I walked around my room trying to reach that goal. Yeah, to totally silly. And finally, I didn't, I would have had to walk up and down the corridor probably 15 times, so I said, never mind. But on the margin, those things help people change their behavior. It's, it's not games and gaming exactly. It's, it's the quantification. It's, it's something that, it's something slightly more ineffable than, people think it's games, but it's, it's counting, it's self-awareness, it's goals, it's, it's a lot of things. And partly it's providing input to the kinds of things that Charles talks about. Suddenly, instead of having a craving for chocolate, I have a craving for meeting my goal. Silly thing, but it happens. Uh, Fitbit is, is one device. There's Zio, which monitors my sleep. Uh, the nights I forget to take my Zio, to use my Zio or my Lark in the morning, I feel kind of as, almost as if I wasted my sleep. Now, I'm not sure that's everybody, but it's, it's, it's an interesting part of the market. We also have genetic information. Now, the, the problem with genetic information, it doesn't really change, uh, at least not genetic information of yourself. Your microbiome changes, your, if you have cancer, those genes change, but your genome is fairly static. The trick is to combine it with other things. Right now, most people finding out their genotype are probably benefactors to research more than they are beneficiaries of research. But it's, it's something that motivates people. It makes them much more self-aware. So your genetics in combination with your behavior, with your eating habits, that kind of stuff matters. Uh, but right now, we, we still are early in genomics, we need to figure out how this works and how your particular genetics, how much of that marshmallow behavior is genetic? How much is your parents? How much is society around you? you know, it's, it's very, very complicated and we don't know. We also can do not just pharma clinical trials now, but these are, this is a company called Genomera. Disclosure, I'm, I'm an investor. People can do their own, call them non-clinical trials. They can do experiments on themselves, they can do experiments in groups, they can set up their own controls. Uh, it's an amazing time, and any clinical person, like many of you here, would say that this is garbage in, garbage out. Maybe. But if the garbage out shows something interesting, then maybe it's worth doing a proper clinical trial with hospitals and doctors and vetted information involved. There's so much to find out that anything that can contribute can be helpful. And again, it can, it can also raise self-awareness among people 
of how their behavior affects their health. What's interesting, and I don't have slides for it, is again, you can now monitor not just your behavior, but also the contents of your blood. Right now, it requires a phlebotomist. In four or five years, maybe sooner, there's somebody here who's, there are a lot of people everywhere who are all working on the holy grail of this particular movement, and that's a non-invasive blood measuring sampling tool. And of course, there are different things you can sample, everything from simply sugar levels to various immune factors to other biomarkers of various kinds. But when people can start to monitor those, then they complete that feedback loop, watching how their behavior changes the composition of their blood. Right now, they can watch their weight. And for many people, that's pretty depressing. Blood markers may be a much, a much more effective and uh, more encouraging thing for you to be able to monitor. Now, how is this market going to work? I talked earlier about long-term and short-term. The problem with people is they like to eat the marshmallows now. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty pathetic if you can't wait 10 minutes for a marshmallow. Imagine waiting six months or five years for a reward. We're just not very good at it. We can learn. We can use the kinds of things Charles talked about. We can go get a job at Starbucks to develop those habits. But we're not very good at it. Employers, by contrast, they are both institutions. And they're interested not simply in reducing health care costs. They're inter interested in increasing the health of their employees. It's, it's not even the cost of treating you. It's the cost of you not showing up for work, the cost of you being unmotivated, the cost of you being in a bad mood because your foot hurts and so you write something stupid on a coffee cup. Employers have a combination of motivation and willpower and in most cases a financial model that looks beyond the next quarter, though sometimes I think that's changing too. Anyway, employers are likely to be the first big market beyond the quantified self leading edge individuals who go out and buy Fitbits and Zios and are willing to spend the money. They are, with luck, going to start producing data that shows how effective some of these interventions can be. They're going to organize their employees into teams and have them play games. They're going to help develop healthy habits, a la Starbucks. And with luck, they're going to prove the effectiveness of many of the tools and devices and social networks and curricula and so forth that are part of the good health market. And with luck, that will move beyond them into the insurance industry where now with different incentives, insurers are also starting to think long-term rather than look only at the cost of care. If they're responsible for the outcome or accountable for the outcome or the lack of outcome five years down the road, then suddenly they're going to start funding health as well as health care. And then maybe the government will get involved. Right now, I would say most of the good stuff that's happening in this social health market is cities or possibly states. But it's, it's not something, I'm not going to get political here, but you know, it, it's just easier for Mayor Bloomberg to do something, even though it creates a lot of feedback. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Bloomberg can put in a soda law. Imagine having the president, whoever that president is, try to do something like that. So these are the things that are finally beginning to happen. Now, the big question is around something that happened 
at yet another healthcare conference, which also had a bad breakfast the first day. That was Medicine X. Uh, on the second day, well, let me, let me step back a moment. We're talking here, Charles talked about going to the hospital and feeling totally disempowered. The health market is talking about empowering people, about empowering people to develop better habits, empowering people to manage their own health before they end up in the hospital, about being conscious and aware, knowing their own genotype, understanding the statistics of a probability of diabetes or Alzheimer's or all those things. That's really, really exciting. The problem with empowerment is it implies responsibility. If you know this stuff, you're supposed to use it. Uh, if you watch the marshmallow video, you want to encourage your child to start thinking long term. You want, not only do you want, you are supposed to be a better parent. You're supposed to take charge of your health just the way you took charge of your career as a woman. You're no longer simply reliant on your husband. In Eastern Europe, suddenly, you have to run your own life. You have to vote for your president. You're responsible for what happens. And that's a big charge for a lot of people. So at this particular conference, a blogger who was obese, got up, and she said, more or less, don't blame me for being fat. I don't want to be blamed. I am fat, I have a thyroid condition, et cetera, et cetera. She was angry. She felt that everybody around her was judging her for being inadequate at this self-empowerment game. We're going to be facing a world if we're not careful, of victims and blamers. So I had the answer to the earlier stuff. It, it was basically in Charles's talk. I don't have the answer to this one. It's, it's going to be a challenging world. How do we deal with, is willpower innate? Is it learned? Can it be learned? Do we all have a responsibility to take a course, go through a curriculum, learn, willpower, understand nutrition? I don't know. It is something that is worth talking about. It's worth society as a group thinking about setting new norms. It's not clear to me. Yes, I think we should tax sugar. Should we tax sugar more for people who are genetically predisposed? predisposed to diabetes or obesity? I don't really think so. I don't want a society, forget how you get billed for your health care. Do you want to be taxed differently depending on your genetics? So I'd like to end here. There will be questions later. And I hope I provoked you to think about things. Thank you very much.